please uh, please uh, take over and I will relinquish my screen right now. Fantastic. Well, delighted to be here and have a chance to talk about one of our favorite topics as well as hear your thoughts on what you find interesting. And so a little bit about our background to build on Ted's wonderful and thoughtful introduction. I spend my time actually living and working internationally. And so much of it has been lately in Europe, but also with time in Silicon Valley and uh, Ted Selker, but of course other colleagues in uh, the area. So very nice to be able to connect with Beikai members as well. And my background is split with work in innovation and strategic foresight, typically large organizations and companies, but also I have a love for teaching. And so I have several different faculty roles working with not just a long running program at Stanford University, but other universities around the world. And that gives me a chance to bridge between thinking and doing and really hearing what others see as valuable. And I definitely have this bias toward action. And, and you'll see this reflected in the stories that we'll share soon about the book. Bill, what, um, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, so as Ted mentioned, he and I uh, have been in recent years working together, but I have to admit that I was the young college dropout in the uh, early 90s who showed up unwashed in Silicon Valley to do technology. And, and Ted at the time was the guru on stage. Um, so I, I moved from manufacturing at Apple, software quality, ended up doing virtual reality research in 95 in the CS world, ended up coming back to doing blue sky research in Silicon Valley for the likes of Daimler Benz. Uh, and then after finishing a PhD at Stanford, uh, have spent 20 years with one foot on campus and one foot off. And it varies from year to year. Uh, this how I brought Ted, I, I met Ted was we brought him onto campus uh, to do a lot of the amazing invention work that he was doing because that's what we needed to bring into the students' mindsets. How do they imagine and invent? And the program we were running at Stanford was our foresight program, which was how to do it way far in the future, look very far, teach the engineers, the business school students to imagine the future, but then draw them back very quickly and get them inventing today. So um, a lot of time on and off as camera works with the uh, exec ed and large corporations, I tend to spend my time with nascent teams that aren't even formed and a lot of time in schools. And so building on this background, you can definitely recognize some of the themes from other works that we've done. And so here's a snapshot of three different examples. On the left, we have the Playbook for Strategic Foresight Innovation. This is available free, so if you can grab a copy online, but definitely focused on tools and how do you make this hands-on and doable. Then we also love and appreciate the work that comes out of the government, and particularly DARPA is an excellent example of high-risk, high-reward work and really trying to push the boundaries of what's possible as technology visions. And then we have a new book coming that's a collection of more scholarly pieces that will be out this fall. And this will be out by Springer. So you can see here, we love helping teams and uh, build the future. And this kind of ties into the book that we'd love to talk with you more about today, which is called Building Moonshots. And the subtitle is 50 plus ways to turn radical ideas into reality. And so as you've heard themes about our background and the other work that we've done, very much reflected here as a handbook for the almost impossible, for the teams and the leaders that have to build, fund, champion these types of radical ideas. How do they do it? Where do they start? And what do they need to think about? And so, we were very excited to discover a few days before its release, and it's only a few weeks old, actually. This launched a month ago and came out on May 9th, and so we had the Financial Times cover this and highlight that it was a useful book. And this, to me, is great because it shows that this is part of a broader dialogue happening now, that the topic of moonshots and radical innovation is top of mind certainly in the business community, but also with international readers. 
who are looking to understand how do they go big? Where do they start? And so to me, this was really very nice validation for what we're trying to do and certainly ups our game as we think about where to tell the bigger story. And as a preview for all of the content, because we won't go through all the 50 plus ways today, here is a free book poster that you're welcome to download. If there's a particular way that interests you, or if you'd like to hear more about, please let us know. And I know we can only cover a little bit here in today's session. And for others who are curious and find this later, reach out to us. And of course, to the broader Beikai community, because I think there's a number of kindred spirits here, but also a lot of possibility to dig in further for these different elements and uh, ways that we're going to highlight. So let's first talk a little bit about what is a moonshot. And I realize I have a, a pretty knowledgeable audience here, but I would love um, in the chat channel, if you will, write down what do you think is a moonshot? What does this mean to you? All right, so as you're posting different comments there, you know, this is a word that you'll probably recognize that has its roots back in the 1960s, of course. Then the US was responding to a political situation and the president JFK made a grand announcement, you know, first to Congress, but then to the American public, we are going to put a human on the moon. And so literally the moon shot is a shot to the moon. And to me, this is particularly interesting and to us, I should say, you know, one, there's this aspect that this is something that you have to do with a set time frame, right? The announcement here is to say, we're going to do this in 10 years or less. So it was a big bet and a lot of pressure to deliver within this timeline. And then the other aspect is this is meant to be a big step, right? Not just a giant leap for mankind, but also this is something that is challenging. It's hard to do, as you can see in the quote. And so this really captivated public imagination. The U.S. was successful, and to date, no other nation has been able to repeat it. And this is a term that now when people talk about moonshot signifies something that is almost impossible, right? A big vision. It is groundbreaking, paradigm changing, and it comes with a major impact as well. And this impact is about making something you know, better for humanity, improving the world. It's not just, say, a startup unicorn that has the investors benefiting and getting rich. This is really about you know, doing more. And so this signifies kind of what a moonshot can promise. Bill, would you talk us through some examples here? Easily. So real quickly, people say to us, well, what are some modern moonshots and, you know, how can I work with them? So we have three examples here that are kind of interesting. They're ongoing. Uh, one, the left one, very technical. Most of you guys will recognize some of the Grand Challenge cards from the 2004 DARPA Grand Challenge. This is when DARPA decided to change its, its mission a little bit. And instead of just funding the impossible, they put some money up and said, let's actually try and do some transformational work and get people to run a challenge. So they showed up. And at the time, the Air Force actually committed publicly that they thought that because of breakthroughs that DARPA was funding, that by 2015, one third of military vehicles on the road would be robotic. Um, we've, of course, passed that time frame. And most of us who are around, we recognize the story, right? 2004, all the teams show up, they fail, but they fail in that kind of really interesting way, which to Edwin's point in the comment, we now know what's more feasible. So 2005, they show up and there's a bunch of winners. Curious enough, one of those winners was Sebastian Thrun, who had the Stanford car. And a couple uh, months later, when he was approached by the Google guys, uh, as it's retold now, the Google team said to him, well, you know, hey, we should try and make a real robot car. And Sebastian said, well, no, it's, it's actually just a research project. It's probably impossible. And the challenge to, to Sebastian was, well, you know, how do you make it not impossible? So they gave him that kind of piece. And this is a technical one, right? It's still ongoing today. Um, and there's been huge leaps. I mean, so it's not like it hasn't gone anywhere. There's been sensors and hardware and technology and vision. All of this keep, continues to advance, but we're still on that moonshot mission because we don't have what most of us would consider safe, pervasive 
driving cars. New recent one, Cancer Moonshot by the administration. Uh, we actually got asked about this yesterday at MIT. Um, a person who was working at, I think, in oncology research was asking, how does this actually impact her? We actually had a conversation two weeks ago in Zurich with a woman who's down at uh, South Carolina at one of the universities, and she works in a really interesting moonshot problem. She's working on the behavioral side of, of uh, how you solve cancer. And it's not necessarily part, it's not currently part of the Biden's program, but it, her moonshot was really interesting. They're trying to solve the spousal issue. So when people come down with cancer, one of the psychological supports is bringing your spouse with you. And of course, what she's done is gone into traditionally African-American communities and where there's not always a spouse in the room and found who, who do you bring? Who would you bring to the thing? And one of the big insights from her team was for, for many of the men, it was the pastor. And this was a huge leap in how we thought about treating um, cancer and, and normally cancer treatments. And the one I actually, I'm putting this number here, um, it's in 25 years by 2047. I think for most people in this group, we're old enough, we can do that math and figure out how far away that is. But when we challenge the younger people in the room, the 18, the 19, the 20 year olds and say to them, okay, you know, it's 25 years in the future. How old do you think you're gonna be? What are you gonna look like? How much is time is gonna go past? And of course the big shakeup is I turn that I say, you're gonna be my age. And they of course just power and fear. Um, but it's to give this idea of, you know, this isn't something that's gonna happen overnight. This isn't a startup. The final one on the right that we just pin up, this is not a technical one. This is actually a social one. It's an educational one. A uh, friend of ours, Fred Swanaker, Ted knows him well too. A uh, young guy came out of Africa, uh, came out of Ghana, Africa years ago, educated in the West, Stanford GSB, went to McKinsey and then realized after one year at McKinsey, he wasn't gonna make a difference for Africa. So if he was really gonna have an impact in Africa, he had his own moonshot. It was going to be to build 3 million ethical and entrepreneurial leaders. And this was at the after point, he'd already built a high school, he'd already built a series of universities. He realized he wasn't moving the dial by trying to move just do high schools and universities. So in 2017, he said 18 years in the future, he was gonna be developing 3 million of them. At the time he said he was imagining he would maybe have a, a way to educate 50,000 people a year. Um, and if you think about scale for that, you know, 50,000 people at a college education level, it's a pretty, pretty big number. Um, I, can prom I can tell you that as, as of last year, he's now educating 200 plus thousand people a year in education using the Holberton School. If any of you guys recognize the Holberton program out of San Francisco, which are actually X42 people out of 42 Paris. So it's a fully accredited online, full computer science training program, software engineering. Um, and Fred's acquired Holberton last year and is now running huge number of people through them at the highest level of standards with real challenges with team-based work. So, you know, there's a broad array of people doing this on a daily basis. I just heard one at MIT yesterday, um, a young kid who came out of theoretical physics, he was a string specialist, He's now completely moved in sustainability and, and climate. And he has this absolutely fascinating measuring atoms. Uh, he just wants to count all the atoms and build models that count all the atoms. And out of that cascades all of these abilities to simulate and model and predict and build better simulations. And you know, it, he can see where it goes, but he can't tell you how to get there. Um, and I think that was the interesting part is back, it's gonna take a long time to get to any of these. So these are some different ways of thinking about moonshots. And to give you an idea, I love the comments coming up in the, the channel as well, because this is part of understanding there's not one way of doing it. And in particular, a moonshot forges an entirely new path ahead. So there typically isn't or inherently a precedent that you're drawing from. And what Bill and I found as we looked at the ways that we've been teaching, at examples before, at organizations that have carved or pioneered different areas, there are certain proven ways that have been more effective or led to better chances. You know, how could we bring them together? And as Bill was hearing these questions from the students and the teams he's worked with, I was hearing this from senior management and organizations and other groups we realized we needed to bring them together. And so that's what led to the book. And in particular, over 50 plus ways as well that we wanted to organize. And so we put them into nine categories and you can see here on the screen, you may start in a different place based on where you are with your idea and your team and the overall journey for the moonshot. So for example, you know, at the start of the book, we focused much more on ways to build the mindset. How do you, have people think about the outlook. How do you imagine 
what's almost impossible, where do you start versus more in the middle of the book? How do you think about stepping stones? Where do you go next? How do you prototype? In fact, we do feature uh, some prototypes from Ted Selker as part of work that he's done. We can put you on the spot, Ted, and talk through some of this, but also near the end, how you finance these types of moonshots. How do you play the long game? How do you think about building those conditions for success when this will take some time? And so many different angles and each way then features a case study, some practical tips from, for teams. So very much you know, really trying to have people know how you can do this as well. And so we thought we could delve into one particular way and this is around where do you start? And in particular, you start with the vision, right? You start with what's almost impossible. And we found that a four horizon model proves a really good way to kind of anchor what you wanna do. In particular, you're gonna have the vision live at the far horizon. But let's walk through this, particularly, particularly if you're not familiar seeing this, even if you may know or talk in this way. So if you look at the first three horizons, now this is very much understanding how people plan, right? Short-term, mid-term, and long-term. So horizon one is H1. This is the focus on the near-term. What do you need to do now, right? As a team, what's on your task list for the week? And for a company, what do you need to get out the door as your products and services? H2 is horizon two. So this is the focus more on mid-term. What are your new business opportunities. So for a company, this will be your next solution and markets that you're defining. And then horizon three is long-term. And so these reflect R&D investments, experiments in the lab. If you're a, a different type of organization, this could be um, you know, other pilots you have underway. And then horizon four is what we've added to because where do you start? You know, these are the sea, the kind of sources of inspiration, the North Star that really lays out your vision. And one of the ways that uh, we found kind of brings this to life is this quote from Logitech. And actually, Bill, let me have you talk us through this. Yeah. So as I would have said this morning, uh, the current CEO of Logitech, Brack and Daryl, but I don't know if any of you guys have seen the press releases, Brack and Daryl stepped down today. So the previous CEO, Brack, of Logitech Bracken. Um, Bracken is an American who took over Logitech about 10 years ago. Most of us recognize Logitech. They're a Swiss company with a strong footprint in America, Silicon Valley. And uh, curious enough, he gave a media interview two years ago to a group called Monocle. It's a, a lifestyle magazine in, in Switzerland. Um, and as Cameron likes to point out, the interview quote was being given to people who are not technologists, who are not R&D and blue sky specialists, who didn't understand the words profit and loss. So what um, what Daryl did was he basically said, look, let me explain how we think as a company. And we have a product innovation engine that's built around three things, trees, plants, and seeds. Wonderful metaphor. And then he goes on to explain what they are. You know, we have a small set of seeds. Um, nobody really knows about them. We run them very fast. We have five to 15 at a time. And these small teams are looking at creating radically new things. The seeds, of course, could turn into plants. And once you have a plant, you realize that's something that you could sell to new customers. It could be a new type, a new breed. And finally, they become trees. Trees are the things that they're grounded, they're very strong roots, they offer canopy, they offer shade, they give you new, new potential seeds. Uh, so this is actually a, a standardized model that we've heard him talk about before. And of course, the classic question is, where do they find new seeds, right? We all know the story about the people that go around the world and find seeds. We actually happened to be at Logitech a couple of weeks ago. We're, we're all we're longtime friends with Logitech, and we were we were there, and we we brought this slide up. And we said, "Oh, by the way, you're in the book." Real quick, do you guys actually live this, or is this just something the CEO told? And they, everyone in the room, was like, "No, we really live this." Um, they actually showed us a couple of slides that we can't repeat, but they showed us how they portion their uh, their budget. They showed us how they portion their time, and one of the things they've been doing a lot more of lately is what we find that real moonshot chasing teams do, which is these are not separate, you know, the lines here, they're accidents. This is just a visual tool. What it really is, is the group, um, as Professor Yoffe out of Yale used to say, what you really want to do is you want to reach forward to the biggest vision you can think of, reach to horizon four, find the thing that just seems impossible. When you really think about it, it might not be. 
and then start doing the experiments to race it back as fast as possible. So this isn't meant to be a timeline, 10, 20, 30 years. This is meant to be a radical big idea, something you could really make some huge moves around. And then be again saying, well, what, what do we have to do today to have the money to then go find whether there's new products? And actually, what experiments can we do today? But we need to be doing them all at the same time. And we need to figure out who we're hiring. We need to figure out who we're partnering with. We need to figure out how the ecosystem needs to develop. Anybody, you guys, you know, Bay Kai is a classic group, right? We all know what happened around Silicon Valley with the growth of different companies and different teams and, and different organizations. So this isn't new for any of us, but I'd say for the younger community, this is a real radical mindset for them. And around the world, this is a message. These types of models, they haven't seen as much. Is that what you were looking for, Tamara? Yes. And I particularly like, this is such a organic metaphor for a tech company, but it evokes very quickly. So then as people start to talk about what's next or where they want to go, they can say, oh, this feels like H3 or no, this is H2 going into H1. And so a question that I often challenge different teams that I work with, as you think about the work you do today, what is your split? You know, where would you put your energy? You know, 80% in H1 or are you, you know, living and creating wonderful chaos, you know, H4 into H3? And so this is just one of the ways that you could think about using this type of framework, but it also helps you start to understand where different ideas span and groups you might work with, as well as where you put your attention and resources. And this leads to thinking also about the numbers that you use. And when you talk about moonshots, big ideas are often best described or presented with big numbers. And the bigger the number, often then the bigger the impact that it can uh, set up. But it's also part of helping people realize what you do to measure or show progress for a plant is going to be different than a seed or a tree, right? And so this is an example that comes from Lenovo, so a very different company out of China. And actually, I'm going to have Bill tell this story here, and then I can jump in and poke. Bill? I'll go faster. Then I actually wrote the case study for Tamara on this one. So you guys all recognize Lenovo. In 2016, Lenovo had just bought Motorola. They had also, or they bought the cell phone company. They'd also bought the uh, data center. I think it was called Think Center from IBM. So, you know, they own ThinkPad from a long time ago. They're hardware guys. They buy two more brands with hardware. And they were not getting the respect that they thought they should get from the investor community. So the CEO came out in an investor note in 2016. And Tamara, do not jump to it yet. Go back. Um, came out with a note in 2016. That'll be the one on the right. And what he did was he laid out a vision for the company that was far beyond, to be blunt, a crappy, cheap Chinese hardware company. Because that's kind of what he was getting valued as. He was getting valued as some, some parts guys. And he didn't think that was fair. He thought the company was actually doing some pretty radical work. So he laid out a vision on the far right, and then he proceeded to spend the next eight quarters on his public earning calls. Remember, a CEO of a public company has to get on quarterly with his CFO usually and explain, here's what we think happened this last quarter that we think is important, and here's why we think you should be buying more of our stock. So Tamara, if you can jump to the next slide. In 2016, he came out with his investor letter. This is just a small snapshot of it. But what he said was he said, oh, my God, we're more than hardware. We're investing in new technologies, emerging technologies. We're doing AR headsets. We're going to work with Disney. We've got a capital group that's investing in new ideas and new partners to build new ecosystems. We're going to do artificial intelligence, have an intelligence transformation, and do smart stuff. Politely, it's gobbledygook. But it was important for the CEO to put this out there and say, pay attention, because we're going to start reporting things that you don't expect. So Tamara, so over the next couple quarters, he would come in with what he called, if you go slide, he had what he called a three-wave strategy, and other is three horizons. And what he would do was each quarter, he would choose which horizon he was going to talk about. It was fairly common for him, most of us that have been in companies, profit and loss statement. This is horizon one. Recognize it, right? Made some earnings. I'm going to tell you how much my earnings are up, my revenues are up, my growth up. It's the kind of stuff that I think most of us as researchers, our eyes just glaze at. But this is what drives the company. This is what drives the organization. This is what keeps the lights on. This is what keeps the salaries going, buys this new hardware. But then he actually had to go on and explain, we have growth going on and we're trying new things. So this is the kind of different metrics that he began to communicate to people. As he talked about Horizon 2, new markets, new customers, 
of course, he was picking up in part Motorola. They had just acquired Motorola's cell phone business. And he started to explain, we're actually hitting it, like we're doing a good job. So instead of talking about profit and losses here, he started also talking about maintaining profitability. He started talking about year over year growth. He started talking about we're, we're, we're doing innovations, we're announcing partnerships. He was trying to say, look, we're getting this ready to be a business. It right now is a plant, but we're turning it into a tree and we think we're getting there. And that's interestingly a different language. You know, don't hold me to what I'm telling you today. It's not successful yet, but gosh, we're getting it ready. We're giving it good roots. But where it really got shocking was when he started putting slides up for Third Horizon research. He started quoting, so, you know, we all know the classic. We're working on research. We have a huge research center. They're doing research. That's usually how it gets shoved off. But instead, he was showing actual things that they were doing. And if none of you have ever seen this Lenovo, this was actually a real product. It showed up at CES, and it was an AR lightsaber game uh, licensed from Star Wars, and it kicked ass. You put on a set of AR headsets. Hey, look, we've all seen them before. They're pretty cool. You got this really nice little wand that you your lightsaber would come up. When you were wearing the goggles and you turned them on, you saw your lightsaber. But more importantly, you saw Kylo Ren in front of you, and you could fight with Kylo Ren. Here's what was so interesting about this. This was a research project that they rapidly turned into a product they could put into market. It was never meant to be a huge product. It was meant to be an award winner. It won awards. And he would tell, in a different quarter, he touted the awards. He would tell the fact that people were saying, oh my gosh, Lenovo was doing some really cool stuff. And got, you know, he was touting the fact that it was actually a pretty cool product itself. And the reviews for this product, by the way, were through the roof. Um, I actually got to try it in Shenzhen about a year after this. Uh, was reported. And I was I was blown away by the technology. And it immediately made me rethink of Lenovo as well. But this is just a really interesting piece to me. These are all public documents. These are all a CEO, you know, a numbers person, a leader person talking about, we're going to hit in all the horizons. We're going to have a big vision. And we're going to talk about our trees, our plants, and our seeds. So is that what you're hoping for, Tamara? Thank you. Yes. And I think, you know, for me, Lenovo is a great example because they deliberately talk about their horizons as waves. And so as you think about a moonshot way and uh, how you could boost telling the bigger story, this is a company that has the information publicly available. And very quickly, you can say, all right, at their wave three, you know, here's how it might match to horizon three and how we might think about it. And you know, part of this is just to give you another perspective and some different tools and you know, approaches to consider as you go big or think about different big ideas that you might do. And so if I get back to then the kind of base framework of the horizon model, as you consider how you might build your awareness in this space, how could you start to think a little bit more and for the teams that you work with, if you're trying to help them with understanding where to go next, you could take this framework and say, what if we layer the news headlines around this? And you could start to see, all right, you know, as a snapshot, now this is a few years old. This is drawn from work that we had done kind of at the start of COVID with a major food company where they know consumer trends, they know purchasing behaviors. They weren't experts in different technology, particularly AI, let alone UX and other applications, but they realized this could have impact on how they thought about their strategy for the next few years and potential partners who could help them think about where new possibilities could exist and breakthroughs to consider. And so they started to say, what if we, you know, could better understand who are the players and you know here's the you know examples and news that fit across h1 versus you know the partners or activities that are happening much more you know so, the cusp of h3 and so one of the H2. things one of the things you could see here for for those just in the room um where are we looking for ideas today so ted you just asked a great question you know logitech does hardware stuff where do they do some ux seeds that we might have seen and this was a real shocking one that when we were in Lausanne, um, they had a keyboard. It was a really clever key, clicky keyboard, but it was really kind of gumball-y looking. It, was, it looked like for, for children. But what was curious was the team explained to us, this had been an experiment in China from a UX perspective. In place of the 
the numpad on the right hand side. Again, it's a kid's keyboard, but imagine slightly wider. So it had a numbers pad on it. They'd actually put on hard coded emoji keys that you could recode in software, but they all had little emoji faces on them. And this, it was just a complete experiment, right? You know, it, it was a seed into a plant. Hey, maybe it does something, but it was a China only product from a China team. And the products proved so successful that they're now expanding it globally. So it's now gone very rapidly from a seed to a plant to a tree. And I should mention that their, their four horizons, um, we actually found out at Stanford about 10 years ago that uh, their four horizons operate in months. And the reason we found that out is uh, there's a very famous project class at Stanford called ME310, where corporate projects are worked on. And uh, the pitch from faculty is, if an industry guy gives us an, a project, we'll help them work through the idea and it'll take us six months because we're super fast and we're a smart Stanford team. And Logitech looked to our faculty member and was like, too slow. We, we do the entire experiment. We try everything from Horizon 4 down to the plant as fast as possible. And it's well under six months. Six months is too slow. When we were there a couple of weeks ago, I said to them, how fast are you going? And they said, yeah, it's, it's months. Um, so just to show you, and particularly in the UX space, they can go very fast. The reason Logitech can move fast as well is they're a hardware company. Tamara, if I can jump on this slide, it's interesting since we were at MIT the other day, you know, MIT Tech Review being here in Horizon 3, 4 to 3 to 2, you know, that's where I would expect to see things. The part that's interesting to me is for, for those of us that spent time in the UX community, and right, and I used to dabble with Winograd's crowd, and, and I come out of, of course, Apple at the day of trying to do stuff. Um, you know, where do we read for new ideas? Where are we looking today for the crazy new ideas? Are we, which movies are we looking at? What, what kind of uh, articles are we reading? What dialogues are we in? Where those crazy new ideas are happening where we go, actually, that's not so crazy. Who's experimenting with this right now? What, T Ted, you mentioned earlier, you know, bringing in Ben's stuff, right? He was, he was the classic team. When I was doing VR, we would always read Ben's work because we're like, he was doing really interesting interface work. Where is the H3 work going on today? Where are the young people doing that kind of work all the way through the model, right? Um, who, who's doing really cool stuff with AR? Who's doing really cool? And I think most of us would recognize we have good reading habits. The part I would challenge any of us to do is how are we teaching the younger researchers? How are we teaching the younger practitioners to read in this format? To read not only, hey, you saw it in The Verge today, that's a really cool new pen, but really where should you be reading the research and learning how to apply it into practice as a product? And more importantly, how should you, how should you test your crazy ideas? whether it's in practice, whether it's in your company, or who should you talk to at the university if you wanna go back and get a degree in this? So this, this model again, as Tamara mentioned, this is a classic model, right? What's happening now? What's coming next? What's over the horizon? And that's absolutely crazy. We, we all know it. So how does it map to all the things we're doing? And this is a tool, of course, that you can keep adding to. I mean, we've got a lot happening now. So it, it's a way for people to better understand how they might see what's coming next. And you know, for those who are less familiar with the landscape, they can also see a little bit more of the big picture. So I found this is actually a great way to build awareness with new groups. But we wanted to also share something that's not in the book. And yes, there's a lot of ways there, but we have a bonus way that's focused on wander and listen. And this is a chapter that we're happy to pass to all of you as well. And actually, Bill, I'm going to put you back on the spot to tell this wonderful story. So the reason the reason this is an, uh, a giveaway chapter, politely, is we found that this is the one that everyone can take home today. Because we've been giving the talk for a while. It comes out of all the teaching we do. It comes out of the practice we do. And we get challenged a lot. Okay, this is great. And models and horizons and debts. But what can I do today? And one of the ones we said, look, it's foundational. You can wander and you can listen and wandering means I'm looking for new ideas in a non-deterministic way. I'm willing to talk to new people. I'm willing to go read something I hadn't read before. I'm willing to delve into a new area. Likewise, listen is something that's wildly underrated. Um, it got, kind of goes alongside asking questions as, gosh, the most important thing might be listening to people, not just talking at them. So for two examples, we, we picked people that of course would be recognized as fairly inter interesting from a moonshots perspective. Um, one of them is, hip, is what I call Hippie Steve. Uh, this is Steve from 1981. Uh, he's what I recognized when I was a kid. Uh, soon after, this is soon after the company's gone public, so he's a multimillionaire. He's being lauded. He's on the cover of all the magazines. And this is the talk that Regis McKenna recorded. Most of you guys have seen it. It was down, I think, at De Anza. 
Um, but it's a short talk and, and he's already telling stories, right? It's Steve, even at that age, he was telling stories. So he's telling this very off the cuff story of kind of like that guru kind of guy. Um, and he's not claiming anything, right? But he's telling the story and the way the story starts, he says, it's interesting. I had a guy from Scientific American come over the other day. And what he's of course doing is he's weaving, by the way, it's a longer story about how Apple is building and pioneering new markets about around education. Because if you can remember 1981, no one knew what to do with personal computers in the real world. So he's telling a story to the Scientific American, but the way he tells the story is, we wandered over one afternoon to a local school in Cupertino. And I had the chance to listen to these children and the way they talk about it was so interesting. And we got a chance to see how they're doing something. And by the way, you know, 20 students interacting with these computers on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Of course, in 1981 talk to Scientific American, to a normal reader, that's mind blowing, right? They, the rest of the world didn't know what was really going on and they didn't understand what it would mean to have a computer in front of a children. So the fact that Steve was using this language so deliberately to tell a story, to try and expand people's thinking, to me is very, very important. And I politely believe Steve had done this. I mean, I don't think he's lying to us because he was known for that type of curiosity for much of his career. Later in times that becomes walking into the UX or into Johnny's uh, space to just see what they were doing. And if you want to jump to the next one, Tamara, one that's more contemporary, most of us recognize Jeff Bezos. This is, of course, later stage Jeff Bezos. Um, he was, this is the last letter he wrote to shareholders. So if you guys recognize, Jeff wrote a letter to shareholders uh, every year, and this is his final one. So let me just put this into framing. He is about to hand the company off to a manager, and he is basically telling the investors to back off. Uh, he's no longer the, the owner, CEO, founder. It is now going to be a manager founder. So this is a very important message. And this is a two-part message. One, he says, look, companies and businesses are all about being efficient, putting plans in place and executing. But at times you need to wander and that is not efficient. Wandering, it's not. It's guided by hunts, intuition, uh, sorry, hunches, intuition, curiosity. There's a bigger prize out there for looking at things that are messy. And the key part here, he says, is wandering is an essential counterbalance to efficiency. You need both and outsized discoveries, nonlinear, what would be called grand challenges, breakthroughs, 10X moonshots are highly like to require wandering. He's doing this to give Jassy, I think, coverage. But of course, most of us have heard the self mythology, mythology that uh, Amazon has given around, where did AWS come from? AWS is told as a story of, we didn't set out to go from being a bookstore to being a cloud innovator. We just happened to discover, we built it. And then we asked a bunch of people and we listened to them and we said, maybe this actually is an interesting product. So this idea of wandering and listening becomes a very interesting piece that you can take back to really any piece today. Um, magazine shops still exist. Wandering over and look at one, what's going on? Other websites exist. Read something that isn't in your wheelhouse. Um, one of the curious ones for a lot of technologists, just go read the headlines at Bloomberg.com and you will be blown away by the amount of technology coverage that Bloomberg does. The reason they do it is fairly simple. Wall Street likes investing in technology. So Bloomberg is covering everything under the sun, hydrogen, genetics, flying cars. They're going to cover one of your friends. You probably don't even notice it. Um, when we found the Financial Times had covered our book, we were shocked in one sense, but at the same time, we weren't because the people that are reading the Financial Times, largely British, British news press, they're looking for where are the next big things coming from? How are companies making? So I'm sure if you go through this list, there's probably one or two that you don't read regularly. And by regularly, once a week, right? Pop it open. Go see what the markets are saying. Go see what the South China Morning Post is saying about Hong Kong. Go look at what the Smithsonian is doing lately. What did they dig up? There's got to be a new tool there somewhere. And then go beyond, right? You know, and, and there's a whole list. And the bigger piece for me is when, when we show this to the younger crowd, one who doesn't know how to read this way, and then we show it to the older executives who've forgotten how to read, both groups get really enamored. And usually a week or two later, you get an email from them or a WhatsApp where they're like, oh my God, I picked up a magazine or I decided to read something I hadn't read in years and it sparked my thinking. And I ran off and showed it to somebody and had a great conversation. And one of the ways that you can help those around you, but also make it easier, is to recognize there's hints that are embedded in the language, right? So if it says words like available or profitable, clearly this will be most likely 
evident in Horizon One, and uh, if it's something that yeah, actually the bill you were pointing out actually with Financial Times for Horizon Four, you're starting to see in the headlines yeah, now so. words like blue, blue sky, sky and speculative. Uh, that helps to show that this is clearly you know happening and people are tracking much more at the H four level. So just some of the hints and signposts to pay attention. And then as the last bit I can get, uh, just a reminder, uh, we of course are thrilled if you purchase a copy of the book, but of course there's other resources to help support. And we know that this is part of bigger efforts underway. So we'll make sure that you get a copy of the chapter that we'll share with the Beikai uh, you know, members here and of course, would love to stay in touch. And I think with that, we have plenty of time to talk and open it up for questions. So let me pause here and say thank you for hearing a little bit around the book and delving into one of the ways. And let's uh, have you know chance to talk through. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, there are a few questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, in the in the in the chat. Um, I don't know whether there are things you'd like to speak more to, uh, but certainly anybody, uh, you know, uh, raise your hand or or just jump in. Even in this case, if you want to mute. We're a small enough group. We can we can almost have a real conversation. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, throw open the <laughs> your mics. Turn on. Yeah. Turn off your moods, everyone, you want to, if you want to. Uh, Bill, do you want to speak to any of those things that I was kind of trying to... Well, I was, I mean, I commented on a bunch of them, uh, but, you know, the, the, the interesting thing was I was trying to find the logic, um, the Chinese keyboard in the background. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the piece that's really interesting to me is, I, I think you were asking, and then we were trading the notes of, you know, why do I want to work on a moonshot? And I, I'll tell you, and if I could, sadly, I didn't put it, I did not get his permission yet to show any of these. So I'm not going to show them to you, except I'm showing you to my phone. But there's a young researcher, as I was mentioning. You know, I saw him yesterday at MIT, and he's a string he's a string theory guy, um, physicist, and he's gone from being a theoretical physicist. He just finished at Stanford, did his undergrad at Brown, and he now wants to do atoms. And his moonshot is to budget any atom anywhere. He wants to create a low cost, globally scalable ecosystem of elemental analysis techniques. And he has a whole model for why, and he doesn't know how to get there, but he can see kind of where it goes. And the reason he wants to do this is that he looks at all the problems of climate change or environmental or energy. And he says, look, at the end of the day, the reason that we still are arguing, even as scientists and technologists, is we just don't have a good way of measuring and, and he has all, and there's a lot of science to what he's saying. I'm simplifying, but it's his phrase as well. He's like, if we could just measure all of these things in a way that everyone agreed and everyone was consistent, there's a lot of models. So his moonshot is one to start coalescing this idea and bringing all the systems together sure. and then push the breakthroughs. And you say, wow, you know, for a 25 or 26 year old, what set him off? And what set him off was listening to Stephen Chu at Stanford. Yeah. talking about how to work on impactful problems. And Stephen Chu basically says, look, you have to work on things that are unsolvable, that are very hard to do. So that was interesting. He was inspired by a gray hair um, sure, sitting but, around saying, let's do it. But I, I got, I got, a, I got, I got to dig a little deeper, which is I, I get the, I get the what, I get the why. I don't know the how. And the how is, is a couple of things that I want you to speak to if you can. What is it? How do you know if you're committed? How do you stay committed? How do other people know you're committed? And what does it mean to be committed? I mean, literally, all of us have these dreams, so, but going so, further is the hard part. Yeah, so so the knowing and getting people to follow you is interesting. Um, you know, I spend much of my life moving between different innovation cultures, and I can tell you one of the stereotypical ones is the you know wild west of Silicon Valley where you you walk into a fills on any afternoon and if, if you have a pulse someone's going to be like what are you working on I'll invest in you and the counter to that is everyone in the valley gets very used to being like oh well you know if I'm not under NDA let me tell you my idea or I've got five ideas 
um, I'm willing to share broadly because I'm willing to look for people that'll work with me. And I'm passionate about working on ideas and sharing ideas. The, the counter to that is when you go into a lot of these communities, and not just corporate ones, but when we go into communities in other parts of the world that will go unmentioned, first question from every young student is, well, but how do I protect my idea? How do I make sure no one steals my idea? And you say to yourself, well, I mean, no one's going to know you're committed to an idea and your passion unless you share with them not just the one idea, but the three or four or five. Because to your point, in order for me to retain my passion, so my doctoral work was in how do new, how do new ideas form? And it, it, mean, it, it was shocking from a social science perspective. It's not shocking for any practitioners. It was me coming up with some dumb idea and then walking over to Tamara and going, hey, I got this really dumb idea. And she listens to me and goes, no, no, that's not really as dumb as you think it is. And I say, really? And she goes, yeah, yeah, I was thinking something else. And all of a sudden, we have a bigger idea together and we all run off to the whiteboard. And, and we know that this is what creates the passion, this is what creates teams. But that's because a lot of us have lived through these kinds of cultures. We lived through the UX revolution. We lived through the PC revolution. Um, for the younger people we teach, it has a lot to do with sharing ideas broadly. Um, I think that's one of the ways, isn't it, Tamara? To get people? To, for the sharing piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't that one of the ideas? Which one? I don't remember the numbers. I don't have the, post the I need... poster again. <laughs> I'll tell you, the reason we did the poster was so we could have it on the wall in front of us, but because we're traveling, we don't have it right now. Um, but I don't know what Ted, what do you think? And I mean, what how do you see the passion? I, I the... think that I think that uh, the word passion uh sounds great. Um, but commitment means you're gonna spend a couple of years and you're gonna stop doing other things. And you're going to find um, what I found with my commitments is that it they only kind of have worked for me when I have other people in trained. Uh, when I do it by myself, even if I pay a bunch of yeah, people yeah. to do it with me, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I I don't it doesn't go as far. Um, and I'm I'm kind of frustrated by like I stopped patenting things until somebody else wants my ideas because <laughs> I'm too lazy to go license all my so you know, so there's a patents. There's a funny story. So I, I think most of you recognize the name Corey Doctorow, who writes largely young adult cyberpunk fiction. Um, and that's not to slander. He goes in the YA column. He makes a lot of money there. Um, but he wrote a recent one. It just came out, Red Team Blues. And I cracked it the other day on the train. And it's the first time Corey's actually written a character that's actually his own age, um, which is about my age, right? So, you know, grayer technology guy. And Ted, what was really interesting was one of the protagonists in the story is actually a gray hair. And he was the, he basically was a, a free and open source software guy, you know, from back in those days who lived uh, with Roman for years and years and years, following his passion, doing the right thing. And it's funny because I'm reading this and I'm doing the whole psychological analysis of Corey as the author of the book, thinking <laughs> to myself, okay, so wasn't Corey part of the EFF? And you're like, oh, right, the EFF. They were cool. And you're like, right, past tense. Like, wait, are they still around? Shit, they were important at one point. They were doing really great things. And I bet, politely, none of my students would know who the EFF is or any of that important stuff. So I was kind of channeling this book and saying, where would my students, where would young people hear exactly the story you're talking about? Which is like, you're going to work for 10, 15, 20 years on this. Say that to a 16, 17, 20-year-old. They don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So yeah, is it something still we have to alive and into? well and making a big impact, by the way? Oh, no, I well, completely built to a point. I would say, to me, a good counterexample, and, and this, this gets, gets to, to Ted's uh, question, question, which is, is how, how the, the force for the moon example, example, if you want to talk about the Stanford mm -hmm. alum and her young view. Oh, you want me to? <laughs> so, so we have a young colleague, Ted, you may have met her. Uh, Louise is a uh, she was originally trained in the French technical programs. She did a master's at Stanford in AeroAstro. And then she tried to stay in the U.S. working for a handful of companies. She worked for Zipline. But then she ended up going back to Paris and France and working on a nanosats company, CubeSat, Cube Satellites. Um, but what she came into about a year or two ago was there was a scientist at MIT who graduated by trying to do biomes in CubeSat. So um, he's basically trying to put the entirety of everything you need inside of the cube set, with the exception of sunlight, because now you can put it up in space, you get the sunlight. So it's going to have the nutrients and the water and the plants and everything that's around it. 
And Louise actually realized that that was a foundational piece of anybody doing interstellar spacecraft, missions to Mars, missions to the moon. If you want to do something interesting long term, you have to figure out how to grow uh, plants inside of a completely enclosed bio. So Louise put a nonprofit together, and this is her passion right now. This is her, her program. And curiously enough, she cannot stop getting people to help her. They just, everyone wants to help her in really fascinating ways. Um, so she's got this nonprofit running out of Paris. She proposed a project to the European Space Agency. They funded it. They're bringing it onto the program. Um, we, she's got the, the, the young researcher who did the foundational research at MIT. He's part of the core member of the team. And it's amazing. This group of young people. And the, the catchphrase they use at the Spring Institute is forests on the moon, which is a really crazy vision. And they have these graphics with forests. And you're kind of like, no, that's actually impossible. Right. The vision is meant to anchor and say, now, what can we do today? And what are the questions we don't know how to ask? So we start building towards it. It's a bunch of young people doing a new space age, which I find fascinating. And it's it's kind of self-driven. And the key that all goes back to Louise, since she was a young girl growing up in France, has always wanted to be doing space stuff. She, and, and you think to yourself, gosh, it sounds like the old space age scientist. She's just driven by it, personal passion. She's drawing lots and lots of people together in really interesting ways. So a question I have for the group here is, what do you see or hearing or even doing that represents something that is moonshot-like or that is kind of that big, bold thinking? Because you're embedded with different communities, and I'd love to hear what you're seeing as these you know, possible moonshots, or if there's not enough moonshot thinking happening either. Any thoughts or reactions? You know what I'm going to talk about? Uh, that is my, the team here. We are, I'm a part of a small group that's trying to uh, shift the culture in academia, especially in the humanities and social sciences, where there is not much talked about in the formal programs about where you're going to find a job. And my discipline, <laughs> Bill is laughing, of course, because academics want to replace themselves. But of course, the statistics from when I was a kid, and I'm a little bit older than you, I think, but, you know, when I was a kid, everybody found a job in academia. There was still expansion of the university and of departments. And the people who got jobs along with me have perpetuated that same optimistic view of there will be a job for you, but we know that there are no jobs in academia right now. And so we consider it, uh, that is the small team, considers it morally as well as uh, uh, pragmatically foolish not to be introducing the range of many jobs one can get with a linguistics degree, bachelor's, master's, or a PhD. And Fingers crossed, next month, we're getting a meeting with a small team of faculty. We said, you can have just faculty in the room. We don't have to let any students in. And then we're gonna talk about some of these issues and what you can do for very low effort and very high return that will help both the mental health as well as the financial health of your students. But this is moving the monolith. You know, This is like the warship trying to turn a little bit this way, right? No, I, I, and you know, you can tell from Tamara myself, since we're both on and off campus people, I'm completely with you on this. Um, we, were, <laughs> we actually had a meeting this morning. So we, before we jumped on the train, we were lingering at MIT, you know, trying to, to get some genius on ourselves. And uh, we actually talked to a colleague from, from a, a school down the street who will go unmentioned. And um, he comes from the Stanford background. So he's, he's an old colleague of ours. And he's been there, he's poor. And we said, so what's going on? What's exciting? And he's like, you know, it's much harder to move a small school than you imagine. And as a small young school, it should be more innovative, but it's not. And you kind of say, yeah, that's interesting, but it's not new. Um, it's academia. And, and your job connection thing is really, really important. I met a young woman at the MIT Museum last night. She was closing. She was one of the, the docents. And we started talking because she was talking to my daughter. Oh, she's a library science student. And my immediate comment was, well, you talked to Chris Borg, and if you talk to these people, no, she hadn't. And I was like, well, okay, well, great. Let's make the introductions because they've all gone and done interesting things. And, you know, 
let's the library science. It's fascinating to me. And there's a young library Absolutely. scientist. Amazing. But I bet, and, and politely, you're like, oh, those jobs are supposed to have died 40 years ago. Well, they didn't. But look where no, they've gone. No, but there are... But Bill, there are very many fewer library science departments oh, and schools oh, I know. than there I were when we die. were young. You know, and I what's happened? And they turned into information science. Yep. Yeah. I see Which is Janet great. has put up her picture. She's taken herself off mute. I want to make sure if she wants to, she ah. has to say something. <laughs> Go, Janet. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, I'm. I'm a mere qualitative researcher, but I work for a lot of big companies uh, uh, with my little company. And uh, I do know uh, my background was in innovation and brand strategy for Nestle many moons ago. And you spend a lot of time in this Um, But I I have noted that, you know, with the retrenchment and everything at the moment, particularly in the Bay Area where I am, you know, innovation. I don't know, know what that word means anymore um, because it definitely doesn't mean moonshots to any of these companies. It's all about return on investment and how quickly they can show it. And and so I, you know, I'm listening to you know where are the big hairy goals that people used to have and the big gnarly challenges. And you know, I used to drop down to Singularity University um, down here, and and you know. I used to love listening to so those challenges the students were faced with and the sort of ideas they came up with. And they were all young people from around the world and they'd bring them together for that uh, showcase of their ideas. But anyway, neither here nor there. I, I, I sort of miss that uh, nowadays because it's just not happening. But I did happen to watch the documentary about Bill Gates uh, the other night and his uh, audacious goal to bring self-contained uh, toilets to I'm sure you've seen the documentary about him and I, you know I I was if I had my time again I want to be there and doing that and achieving that goal with him because what a difference that could make to to the billions of people in the world who don't have clean drinking water or you know clean sanitation and those are the, the big hairy goals I, I miss working on in today's world where it's you know, so incremental. On the other hand, I also think putting an eraser on the end of a pencil was a great innovation. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we were sitting with um, a gentleman who runs now runs the MIT Climate Grand Challenge. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was launched during COVID. Mm -hmm. It was launched with, it sounds like experimental money. It, it almost sounds like a, a seed. And now they brought in an ex-RBE program director to run it. Of course, we all know that there is a new president at MIT. She just gave her uh, introduction speech a few weeks ago, and she has set out to make climate change one of her pillars. And what was curious, back to you know, speaking of the old days, she was quoted as saying in her speech, she wants to bring grand lab level innovation conversations back at, to MIT. And, and of course, I'm like, grand lab, like, wow, that's much older than I think any of us in the room were thinking, but yes. And when we were talking to the head of the CGC, one of the things I said to him was, what if we can connect your program with this amazing troop of young African kids who come from a very different context and who, um, when they do the survey for Fred Swanaker's university, no, they can all get access to a computer. Not a problem. They can all get access to the internet. Not a problem. Their problem? Access to power. There, there, there's no stable power anywhere. So, you know, you take a, a climate grand challenge and you start talking about the leapfrogging opportunities, the contextual opportunities. Think about hundreds of teams across Africa, Malaysia, Latin America. I mean, Tamara's a uh, professor of practice at Egadi Business School, which is part of Tecne Monterey in, in Mexico, which of course has a reach all the way down through Latin America. These groups are not included in the dialogue. So that's your point of singularity. One of the reasons we're not slumming in Stanford as much as we have for the last 20 years is we're trying to scale these types of dialogues everywhere else. So we don't need more kids at Stanford learning about loan shots. They already get enough people telling them to change the world. The yeah. question is, how do we, how could we empower? I mean, again, I'm at the student side, right? How could we do what you just said, which is empower these younger kids across Africa, Latin and Malaysia to know that they can do this, to be inspired, and then we have to figure out the resource part next. And that's, I think that's the job for the adults personally. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you're, you're, I think uh, Tamara, that was, I loved your, your question there. You know, just this week we had an announcement of a new um, 
uh, mixed reality headset from Apple. And uh, I was part of making Magic Leaps one. And it had, you know, high resolution, great color, you know, great sensors. You could put a butterfly on your finger, all that stuff. And so does Apple's. And Apple's has a wider view. Okay, great. So I've watched this moonshot since 1983 of these uh, glasses. And by the way, the first really good virtual reality was in the late 20s done by the Lynx um, uh, flight simulator. And the Lynx flight simulator made, made a guy very, very, very rich and saved lots and lots of lives by, by training people before they flew. So it's not that it can't be done. But what I've seen is a lot of moonshots are partial moonshots. What you have to do to make a mixed reality headset is you have to make a scenario. Like, like for example, there's a million people welding right now. Wouldn't it be amazing if they could see how deep their welds were, where their welds were good while they were welding without burning out their eyes? Um, but that is, I think, a lot of moonshots don't embrace an actual scenario and solution. Uh, they embrace just this grander of, of possibility. So I want you to speak, if you can, to the difference between grandeur of possibility that is science fiction and grandeur of possible of of prob of 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 action which is something that well, will really change something so, so, ted, so ted you're kind of throwing the softball i think because i mean you know what you know what you and i do right so i spend the majority of my time struggling to figure out how to get teams notably younger teams um, who are naive and therefore more, more open to listening to do what, exactly what you said, which is, okay, let's be inspired by fiction and science fiction. Let's, let's, let's find our inspiration. And then let's realize that that's not impossible. There's probably ways to take it apart, experiment with it. But why would we experiment with it? What would the scenario be? And, you know, you've seen the way we try and teach in our Moonshots program, which, it, you know, it, it, it grows out of the 20 years at Stanford that I was in Foresight, the which, of course, is born on the fact that I was in practice for 15 years in the Valley before that. And then Silicon Valley, or Stanford's history in the physical, tangible space goes back to the 50s. There's this, like, let's build a scenario tangibly. Let's put the customer in as a little character. Let's tell the stories. Let's, let's build pieces around it. You've seen how we try and teach by embodying what you're talking about. Let's Let's make a story up, but let's then live it three or four different ways. And let's make little ones and big ones. And let's make ones to then share our passion with other people. And now let's start taking it apart and saying, well, what can we do today to move forward? And of course, a, a Stanford bias is, well, we build. Like, let's just build something, uh, which I think we share with your, your vision, Ted, which is like, well, let's build one. Like, let's build a half of one. Let's build like, but let's build so we learn the next level. What can we do? What don't we know yet? which informs our ability to understand things. We teach, um, and I think Ted, to you, I mean, you know this, my failure at, at living the moonshot's way is that for about seven, eight, nine years, we've kind of known we could make this a really big deal to help the world, to change how young teams work. And we I just haven't got around to it. It really it just hasn't happened yet. Um, but I think we could do it. And I think there's a huge hunger and there's a huge youth population who are going to need it to solve all the problems that are coming at us. But by the way, um, older people tend to have more successful startups than younger people. So I it isn't just yeah. older people. That oh, no, no, I'm with you on the data. data. Right. So it's my job to do it because I'm almost the right age where I'm supposed to be the CEO now. The reason I like the younger people politely is if I can influence them earlier when they're naive, then they're going to have longer to work at it. And my partner in crime who's sitting next to me, she's out doing the executive education. She's out working with the adults in the room. And they ask really I tough just, questions, just, just, really just, tough questions that I don't want to have to answer. Um, so brain-computer interaction. Here's a moonshot that has been followed dozens of times for dozens and dozens of years with lots of false promises. What do you think about moonshots relative to being real and people making uh, calibrated, um, knowledgeable, scholarship-directed um, basis for their school. Let, let, let's let's pick all of them, right? So um, we know that that Elon and Neuralink just got approval to do another study. That's interesting. 
not to say that they're important or this is the right study, but they're taking steps forward. Um, one of the pieces that we know from a friend of ours, we met him at Stanford. He's a young scholar. Um, he's doing interesting stuff with fMRIs and looking at how do people communicate and collaborate. So he's putting three people together in fMRIs and they're playing games together. And the reason that one was so interesting to me is um, when I had my son partake in a brain study program at Stanford, it must have been six, seven years ago. Let me tell you, the hardest part of the brain study program was scheduling time on the fMRI. There were almost no fMRIs available to researchers at Stanford, what was it, seven years ago. So when I find out a few years ago that this new young professor is getting three fMRIs at a time, it was like, how do you schedule so much time? And he goes, oh, because we have like 40 or 50 of these things now. That is part of this advancement. You know, a new tool, now the tool goes from zero to one, one to 10, now that it's 10 to 100. Okay, that's important. And what was fascinating for this young researcher, and in my mind, was he was doing fMRI studies. But when I walked into his lab, he had a 3D printed, free and open source uh, crappy thing for putting in little sensors from Amazon that came off of the OpenBCI website. And I, and I looked at him, I'm like, oh my God, you're doing OpenBCI along with you're at the cutting edge of fMRI. That's fascinating, right? When you have the open source people working alongside the science people. Uh, Ted, you know, I mean, we all know this. These are parts of the pieces we look at and go, okay, is the field advancing? It, what's advancing? Which part of it? Um, do we actually have a, a BCI solution? I mean, we see the experiments, right? We see little things that make somebody walk right now. We see monkey's tests. We know that that's still too early. But, you know, is it moving forward? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I, would I, guess. I see a couple of people. We have enough people, a uh, few enough people that uh, Shazi. Sha, Sha I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, or Jeffrey, do you, either of you want to uh, jump in, or, or Edwin, um, just to try to get, you know, other people um, to have a chance? I think one of the things I haven't, um, maybe, I think one of the things that is best about Moonshots for me is that, like, it, it, we saw the word vision in some of the, in some of the uh, slides, and I think, it is the uh, it is the opportunity to attach yourself and to commit yourself to something bigger, right? It's almost it's almost giving someone a, uh, the opportunity to work for a mission, um, and that I think that inspiration um, is not something that we can discount. I think in the creation of a culture. Uh, give providing that inspiration is a huge deal. So, I'm just joking. I'm laughing to Tamara. I said that's your chapter. So <laughs> Tamara's Tamara's doctoral work uh, at Stanford was she went and we we were sitting around Cafe Baroni one night, going. God, these social scientists, you know, every time they want to do studies, they do a survey or they, they count patents. Like, but that's not where the big stuff happens. The big stuff happens, Edward, to your point, with this weird word vision. And, and, and people that live in the space use it not to mock. It's like, no, no, and then the vision. And then we put the vision in and we do something with the vision. And we know that there's, it's changing and it, it, we're using a word for broad brushes. So, she actually, Tamara actually went and studied DARPA uh, in, from the inside. She had massive numbers of interviews. She had Bob Taylor, um, talked to her extensively, had Tony Tether. But her question was, and I forget, Tamara, what exactly is your thesis point? Just that, well, there's a couple of points, but a key, key element around vision is that's where you need to start with radical innovation. And it's um, also, the person needs to bring a vision, even if it's half-baked, because that's part of what can excite the team, but also give them the energy to consider new possibilities. And uh, this was also very much a uh, counterintuitive perspective, because often for organizations, you start with a clear job rec. And it's all about the skill sets or the abilities, the pedigree that you need to bring. It's not 
start with the vision. And DARPA is a great clean case study with a clear data set because they have such a strong focus on radical innovation, aside from the classified work and such. But you know, these ideas that they fund, they need to start with somebody who is bold enough and willing to put a vision out there, even half-baked, and then invite a community or create a community, an ecosystem around it. And I think you raise a very good point. And when you know, having that vision provides inspiration and it allows a bit of the permission to say, if you could do something bigger, you know, why are we here? I think Janet, you hit on part of that too, you know, going to the Singularity student events and um, some of that energy that I think a lot you know, sees missing from Silicon Valley today, or the events have gotten a little more dispersed given fragmented Zoom calls and, and such, uh, and, and how we try and find more of those touch points. As you're talking about this and, and referring to the vision, the vision, I'm thinking of the case study, and Janet, you'll help me remember the name of this woman, uh, an anthropologist who was working for Nokia, must have been 20 years ago, um, and she came from her field work talking to people at all, you know, all different levels of society and noticing how habits around cell phones were changing and that people were wanting them or not wanting them or sharing them or not sharing. Anyway, she said, this is, everybody's going to want to have their own cell phone with giant capacity very soon. And they, they said, we're going to stick with these, uh, T to what, what is it? You know, T3 devices. And, uh, that's going to be okay. And of course, yes, there's, there's Ted. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, many <laughs> cell phones. Right? Many cell phones. No, and, and do you remember this woman? Does this sound familiar, Janet? Um, actually, it's not sounding familiar, no. I'm oh, I'm going to have to go find it now. Oh, Nancy, I'm, I'm not thinking of a woman, and I don't know that exact study, but Jan Chipchase yeah. was doing the work. So was he next to her? No, I, I mean, I think she, pre when was she doing this? Like the early 2000s. Jan, oh. I met, I met Jan in like 2004, yeah. uh, 2005. And he had just finished some of that work where he was, he had taken cell phones over to India and, and bashed a piece of them. And he was looking at the rebuild culture. Right. Existed. And she, she was in China. Is and, it the, okay. I don't know this one. Is it the TED talk? Jan yes. Chipchase? Not yeah, the anthropology of mobile phones. That's Jan. That's different. Oh. And and this is somebody else who I think was independent of him. Anyway, I'll find it. it is. I'll, I'll send it around. Huh. Just a second. I you know, I'll, <laughs> and, I'll figure out who it is. I, and I'm gonna have to be rude because it's getting to be midnight here in New York and we're still yeah. jet lagged <laughs> from Europe. <laughs> Um, but I did just add in the pieces that I promised uh, William Von Villian's website. William is a MIT longtime uh, advisor in DC who is one of the world's dark experts. The next link is to the book he did with Richard Van Atta mm -hmm. and Patrick. It's a free and open source book, so you can download it, you can read it. And the reason I was laughing, uh, Edwin, at your comment was Tamara's chapter five is the value of vision, which is based on her PhD. And, and this is actually the first invited chapter in the book because she knew she knows William and Richard and they were like, this is DARPA. You got to start with a vision. And they use different words for it. Um, but at the end of the day, to your point, and Ted, I think you get back to your issue. Vision is what helps us as innovators communicate to ourselves, tell ourselves a story of why we're doing this. It's certainly what we tell the other people, not for fundraising, but like, why would they work with us? Why would they follow us? And hopefully the vision is bigger than any of us can achieve. And again, how far can you push it? And then brass tacks. Yeah, but what are we doing today? Like, we can't just talk about a vision of the future and then go to lunch. Like, we have to start making steps towards today. And that's, I think, what we were trying to get in the book. So, you know, it's not a tools book. It's not a methods book. It's more of there's a lot of stories in it, a lot of good reflection questions. And again, we're finding, and you guys are a little late. And you, I mean, it's like week three of us talking to lots of different people. And and you're, you know, people are just really excited by it. They're, they all want to be part of it, which is really, I think, inciting me to like, okay, I need to get off my ass and do more. Um, so thank you for letting us share a little bit with all of you too. Well, thank you for staying up for us. My goodness, <laughs> it's late. Thanks for all the energy. Thanks for all the work. Um, I think this idea of uh, planting seeds everywhere, uh, 
you guys are kind of Johnny Appleseed of, of innovation, I think. And and uh, we hope it goes goes well with the rest of your uh, your talks. And please get a little bit of sleep tonight. And it looks like a a nice uh, a nice place that you have to be. So enjoy enjoy. And uh, thanks for taking the time to 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 join us.